Sunday, June 10th, 2018, and I'm your host, Tracy Harris, and with me today is, probably for the first time ever, my co-host, I don't Matt know. Dillahoney. I feel like we've done this at least once before. I mean, Maybe. we've done a I gazillion shows. I don't know. It is rare for me to be on this side of the table, but... <laughs> it is. Uh, it's interesting. It's cool. Yeah. And I'm going to talk all over you today. Good. So we'll get complaints. Uh, the Atheist Experience is a production of the Atheist Community of Austin, a Texas nonprofit educational organization dedicated to promoting separation of church and state and positive atheist culture. And I just want to mention that we have been doing dinners here at the Free Thought Library after the show. Um, I think a while back we used to go to a restaurant and we tried a few different restaurants, but we're now we're trying to utilize the building and put it to some good use by having hosting dinners here at the building. And you can come on out and join us. It's open to the public. And I was told that tonight we're having the party tray from, uh, what was it? Uh, Thundercloud. Thundercloud Subs yep. here in Austin. They're like a little Austin favorite. So come on down if you feel like it. We're on Koenig, and I'm sure they'll be, they've got the address right there. So there you go, 1507 Koenig Lane. So anything to talk about today? Nope. Nope, no news. I don't. I don't actually. Uh, th this is my month off between kind of tours, and so and weird stuff has happened. <laughs> um, so yeah, I'm just working on the videos, doing every episode of the show this week or this month. Okay. Um, next week, I forget exactly who I'm on with, but then the 24th is the thousandth episode of the Atheist Experience. Uh, and Seth Andrews is coming down to do that Aww. show. Yeah. Well, that's nice. Yeah. Mark said, hey, you can have any co-host you want. And I was like, ah, I'm calling Seth because he has never done the show. Oh, that's so unbelievable. So, yeah. so right now we're figuring out. I was like, oh, you're going to drive all the way down from Oklahoma and do the show? And he's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's then he messaged light. me yesterday and he's like, I wonder if I should maybe drive or fly. Or... I'm thinking fly. <laughs> Seth, you should drive and you should come down and spend a few days. He could fly and spend a few days. Because you need to practice. We'll come in here, we'll do the show, we'll, we'll rehearse, because this is all staged, none of these calls are real. No. Uh, oh boy, that clip's gonna yeah. win in for me. Thanks! <laughs> the, the nice thing is is that the, there's the people who call can actually say, no, 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 that was really me, and I really said that. <laughs> it's, it's funny because of all the years that we've done the show, there have been prank calls that weren't real, then there were real calls that I didn't think were real. And oh, there, I'm sure. Then there were not real calls that we thought were real. Yeah. But the, the nice thing is, is that, you know, we start the show at 4.30 Central, and it was what? Four o'clock? Oh, and yeah. And all the lines were already full. You can't yep. even get through the show unless you call, like, 45 minutes ahead of time. So. Yeah, or, like, when, or as soon as somebody hangs up. Yeah. Be on the line. Maybe you sitting there, redial, or, <laughs> or click call, call, call. Yep. Uh. Oh, yes, yes. You have an announcement regarding the Patreon. Do I? We have a Patreon channel. <laughs> Does we have, do we have it for, I mean, I had the, the little blurb, I but it doesn't say anything about what, I mean, is it already up and running? Are we? So I would imagine that if you go to the Atheist Community of Austin webpage, atheist-community.org, uh, you will find information, if not now, then very soon, <laughs> okay. uh, because the ACA has launched Patreon projects for uh, th this show, Patreon sla uh, patreon.com slash the atheist experience, uh, and also for Talk Heathen, et cetera. Um, essentially, we've been doing this show for 20 years, and things keep improving. We've got a building, we've got a uh, studio and equipment, but all with that comes a lot of overhead. Um, so you can donate at the Patreon project uh, to help support the efforts of this show and the ACA's other shows. And by doing that, you can get access to ad-free content and patron-only uh, videos and things like that. Mm -hmm. um, and your name in the credits. And your name in the credits. <laughs> For what it's worth. That's even on there. Yeah. That's what they told us. I'm good. Okay. Thank you for saving that, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so I guess let's go ahead and hit the callers. So right now we have Joel in Atkins, Alabama. Hi, Joel. Hello. Um, who, am I, who am I speaking to today? You're talking to Tracy and Matt. Okay. Well, good to, good to be here. Um, I have an argument for reincarnation. And uh, I like what Matt says. If you have a really good idea, why don't you try to get it published? Or and I've tried to get this published. Uh, I've spoken to different philosophers about it. I've argued it on Reddit. So uh, I'll just, I've got 
a paper here with a with a lengthy argument on it. I'll just read the first paragraph and we can talk about it. Um, baseline awareness, calm state, after anger, sadness, or excitement. The, the recurrence of baseline awareness guarantees that I will live again after I die. This is the seed from which awareness arises. If an infant in the womb has the same baseline awareness I had when I was alive in a previous life, that infant is me because I was that awareness, at least in seed form. This seed gives rise to all of my awareness. So the point is, um, after anger, sex, or excitement, I calm down to basically a kind of tranquil state, and that's a recurrent state, and that all of awareness uh, arises out of that, and that even if, um, even if my awareness is completely annihilated when I die, it will recur again in uh, an unborn child, uh, basically in the womb, because I think that, you know, unborn children are uh, conscious and they're aware because they suck, they suck their thumbs and they uh, punch and kick and stuff like that. So that's the basic idea. What sense, in what sense would the consciousness of a newborn infant represent what we would call you? Well, um, it's, it's kind of like uh, the basis for me because I am not my thoughts, really. I can't say I am my thoughts and I can't say I am my body, but I can say I am my awareness. And so if you peel back kind of the layers, there's, there's a kind of core and that, that is my awareness and that recurs, therefore I recur. So Let's say there's an, inf an, an inf infant in the womb. First of all, I, I don't think that they're uh, conscious to the extent that you do, and we know that children uh, develop a theory of mind. It's not like they're born with an understanding. But let's say there's an infant in the womb, and it's experiencing anger, and uh, you and I are both dead. How do we know which of us is that baby uh, under your model? Well, it, it, I think in theory, if we had the same baseline awareness, it would be both of us. Okay, because well, that's just ridiculous. A single awareness. That, it's ridiculous. No, no, it that, be, it's ridiculous to say that it's you and that it's me. Because well, it, that, it, violates, it like, that violates what we understand about identity. You right. are you and I am me, right? We are two separate entities, right? Well, there, there isn't an identity at this point. It's like it's like the baseline of a song. The baseline. If there is no identity, then, then how is, could you yeah. could say the baby is you? You can't. Well, I'm saying I would arise out of that. Okay. I, I first of all, I, there's nothing about this that fits with any model of individual identity, and if you're just going to say that because a baby can seemingly have experiences that are similar to you, and that means that you are reborn, I'm going to say, no, that's not what that means. Well, I mean, it has as much validity as me saying that I am Matt, right? Because me and well, Matt can both no. be angry and we're both aware. No, because you're not, you're not your thoughts and you're not your body. Sure, I am. But, it, it, I mean, it, it, essentially, we're all, I mean, essentially, at, at the core, I think, there's an argument to be made that we're all the same as far as that baseline awareness, that ba most basic awareness. Then that renders your point irrelevant because yeah, if we're all saying. the same, then you don't get to say that you are reborn. Basically right. what you're saying is another entity is being born that is similar to or identical well, that's to the Well, that's why I was making the point that it's no well, different well, than me saying I'm Matt. Here's, yeah. here's, here's the point, here's the point. Okay, if, if I slip into a coma, my awareness is annihilated, but I, uh, I emerge from that coma a different person, let's say, but I'm still a continuation of what I was before the coma. Well, you, you no, I, I, think, go, go well I think that there are people who would actually say that, that sometimes somebody suffers trauma and they are, quote, a different person. And I'd say you're a different person every single second of every day. You're constantly changing. You don't have to do a coma thing. Just, you know, you don't even have to really go to, go to sleep or take a nap. You just, I'm a different person than I was yesterday. Right. Well, the point is that your your awareness continues. Yes, and the, and there's no continuity between your awareness and the baby or the infant in the womb that you're pointing to. There, there's no con continuity of experience there. If it's the same awareness, it's well, okay. The same first of all, same thing. First of all, no, it wouldn't be the same thing. You 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 have this fuzzy notion of awareness. How would you demonstrate? that an infant in the womb not only has awareness, but that it's the same awareness that you or somebody who deceased had. 
Not the same, not the same, not, hang on, not the same type of thing, because that's just saying we're all human. Uh, but, but literally the same. I'm, st I'm kind of hung up on the idea of why would I not then be able to say I am Matt? Well, in a sense, you would be, well, because you're, you're, you're in a spatial temporal location, you're in a different place. But if we're not our bodies, then I'm not, right? I'm just awareness. Well, I think in a sense, you really are your awareness. I think that's what a person really is. And in a sense, right, but what you're saying is that if we have a similar experience of awareness, then we are, we are the, the, the same. And what I'm saying is then why, can't, why can you be an infant in the womb, but I can't be Matt? Because Matt is in a different location, he's in a different But he's body. not his body, yeah. right? Didn't you say he's not his body? So there is no, no location. He, well, no, but he's, he, 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 his body is part of him. So we are, to some extent, our body. Okay. Isn't that what you are saying, which is different than what you said earlier? No. I yeah, earlier you said you're not he your body. He said everything. He said And now you're saying that he's he's located in a different space and therefore it can I can't be Matt and yet that requires us to acknowledge that he is in fact in some respect his body. Well, he's his body it's like Isn't the infant also what? in a different space? Yes. Yeah. So, we're right back to Tracy's point. Well, okay. You, you have you have a bunch of terms that you haven't defined, and you have a model that you offer no explanation for how you could remotely demonstrate it. Let's say for a second we had a really good understanding of awareness, of all these things that you think make you you. Even if we had a good understanding of it, how would you demonstrate that an, in, a, a baby in a womb is in fact you reincarnated? Because it is a continuation of It's not life. a continuation. You don't just get to assert it's a continuation. What, please draw the connection from you dying that continues to that child. Yeah, which of the children that's born after okay, you well, die is it's like, you? It's like, the point I made, it's like the point I made about the coma. I'm a, I, if I emerge from the coma as a different person, I'm still a continuation of what I was before the coma. But, but right? yes, because, because you're talking about you're the same physical form, you're the same brain, you just happen to be slightly different than you were before, but that's about identifying this particular body. This is me. This is but Matt. I'm not, I'm not this is Matt. Way. Let me I'm finish. This is Matt. I just changed in the course of this conversation. I'm now different from I was at the beginning of the conversation, if for no other reason than I now have that's the memory it. of this conversation and the fact that I've breathed in different atoms. Okay, so I'm I'm different. This okay. the, you you wait, no stop. You don't get to claim a continuity. That infant in the womb started with a sperm and an egg, two physical things coming together in the womb. Correct. Correct. What is anything else added to that? I I don't know. I don't think so. Okay, I don't think so either. That means there's no continuity from your death to that sperm and egg? Well, here, let me make this point. Okay, Heraclitus said you cannot step into the same river twice, but the same process that carried my horse downstream 10 minutes ago, and me downstream. So it, there's more, it, it, the river is, a, is itself a process that can be the same from one moment to the next. Okay. Okay. I, I think I think you've dived into a, a mass of confusion and metaphor, and you're trying to claim that things are the same, and you're denying identity, and you're making claims about who we are and what we are, and trying to find some way. This isn't an argument for reincarnation. This is a bunch of assertions from ill-defined words. Yeah, there really is no argument here, and there's no demonstration of, of causality. Saying, the, the, the argument is that awareness, my awareness, and my consciousness arises out of the baseline awareness. Uh, and what, I don't know what, what a baseline, what is baseline awareness, awareness is. I mean, you're saying that, that that's when you're not angry, right? When you're just kind of sitting in your calm. Yeah. Consciousness, okay, first of all, I, I still don't understand what baseline awareness is, um, but what you're describing is consciousness uh, arising from baseline awareness. 
uh, is, I, I don't understand how that's even remotely a model of consciousness. If you said that consciousness okay, is something, okay, okay. if you said that consciousness is something that arises from a brain, a mind at work, that's something I could understand because I know what a brain is and I know what a brain does. I have no idea what baseline awareness is because it sounds like something you just made up. Okay, here, 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 let me define consciousness, okay? Consciousness occurs to awareness. Thought that's not a definition. That's not a definition. You can't say, let me, let me you let can't me say, let, let me, me, hang on. You can't say, let me define consciousness and start with consciousness, consciousness. begins with, you know, that's not a definition. That's a description of how it arose. That's like well, saying, let define. me define rose. A rose begins as a seed pod. Okay, it occurs to me that it's something. That what? Okay, that thought, it, it occurs to me that it's Sunday. Okay, consciousness is not awareness. Consciousness is what occurs to awareness. Okay? I, I would say okay, except that <laughs> you haven't actually, def that's not a de definition of anything. And first of all, I don't know that consciousness is anything other than awareness. Yeah, I, I can't really figure out how they'd be different, how those two words would well, be different. Well, a thought, a thought occurs to me, it, and, and that is in itself, it's like a, a ball striking a tree. The, it, it, the that's you becoming aware strange. of something. But hang on, because it doesn't matter if consciousness comes from awareness. What the hell does that have to do with whether or not an infant in the womb is in fact your consciousness? Because there's a source and the source is recurrent. How do you know that? How do I know that? I think it's possible. I, I'm not arguing okay, the then, then I don't care. I, yeah. I couldn't possibly care yeah. less I, I, if when I, I ask you how you know something, I you say because it's possible. I think at that point, yeah, we're at the point where go back to the table and figure out how to show that it's actually happening, and then we have something to talk about because possibilities okay. are very, yeah, good, you know, there's a lot of them. And, and there's a lot of conflicting possibilities, you know, that are... And you haven't even demonstrated it's you know, possible. You it's just possible think it's possible. that this isn't the case, okay. too. Here's something from experience <laughs> that we all know, okay? I'll 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 bet, you want to bet on that? Before you, say, before you say something from experience that we all know, do you want to bet on that? No, well, I don't have to bet. Okay. I don't want to bet. Look, let's say I have a piece of fur in my hand. And I stroke the piece of fur with my thumb in the same way each time. Okay, this is an argument for the soul because I'm having the same subjective experience over and over again, but my brain state is not the same each time. So that means there's something in my, in my consciousness or in my awareness that is not purely my brain because I'm having the same subjective experience, but my brain state is not the same each time. I don't even know what to say to that. Fur feels like fur bet. even when I'm angry. We're going to have to move on, um, but I mean, you know, maybe think about this some more, and if you, you know, come up with something but a an little... For the soul it's not an it's argument. Not an it's argument not an at argument. At it's not supported um, by evidence. The fact that you don't understand something <laughs> and you just want to offer forth more confusion doesn't get us any closer to understanding it. <laughs> These are assertions. Okay. But thank you, Joel. We're going to go ahead and let uh, you go. Bye-bye. Okay, so now we're moving on to Ahmed in Pakistan. Hi, Ahmed. You're talking to Tracy and Matt. Ah, which reminds me, and we're glad you're here and calling from Pakistan. We also have uh, a live studio audience out there, uh, and they're not all from Austin either. There's uh, uh, folks from Temple and uh, Fayetteville, North Carolina, out there in the on the other side of the glass. So we're all thrilled that you're calling all the way from Pakistan. Hi, Matt and Tracy. Um, yes, I'm also thrilled. Uh, also lucky to have both of my favorite hosts uh, on the show today. And uh, <clears throat> I have called the show before. Um, you know it is how dangerous it can be to um, make these assertions or uh, state your belief or, in, or lack of belief in religion in a country like this. Um, yeah. So it's uh, it's very uh, I'm actually very happy to be able to talk about this. Um, I am raised and born Muslim, um, and uh, a practicing one. I have a family of uh, very practicing people, um, but I've always been a skeptic my whole life. So even as a child, I would put forth questions that I would never get answers to. Um, so the only thing that kept me uh, sticking to uh, my belief was 
I read a lot of uh, science in the Quran, and I know you've spoken about this a lot, but I've never really heard about this in detail. So I, um, I'd like to think that I'm uh, a reasonable person, and I'm genuinely seeking the truth. So um, I'd just like to hear what you have to say about that. There is no science in the Quran. Oh, actually, okay. I shouldn't say that. Um, because that 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 might be a bit broad, so uh, let me let me put it this way: science is not just a proclamation about something. Science is a is a process. Science is the method by which we discover things about the world. Uh, there's no method that I'm aware of in the Quran. What there are are claims that many years after the fact, people go back and say, oh, hey, look, science has just discovered this, and I can read this passage in the Quran or in the Bible or wherever, and I can kind of interpret this in a way where it seems like these people were making proclamations about science. If, if there was a proclamation about a scientific fact, it should be something that should be specific and profound, like uh, not just, oh, you should wash your hands, but oh, here's an understanding of the germ theory of disease. Even though you don't know it now, there are these little things that are far too small for you to see that are the cause of illness in human being. And at some point in the future, you'll develop a technology that will allow you to see things that are smaller than you can see with the naked eye. That would be kind of profound. Um, it wouldn't, though, even if that's what was in there, it wouldn't tell us any, it wouldn't enlighten us as to the fact or provide any demonstration of it. Because even if you had a book that was, let's say, you know, a thousand years old, that talked about um, entities too small to be seen with the naked eye that were causing disease, you have no foundation upon which to accept that this is the truth until there's actual evidence for it. And the books aren't providing the evidence. And mostly they don't say anything remotely that clear. Instead, it's you know, I've, I've heard that you know, the fetus looks a little bit like chewing gum, and look at this, the, the Quran is saying something amazing about fetuses that we wouldn't discover for, for many, many centuries after. And that's not even true. If you think people in agrarian <laughs> societies uh, watching uh, our, our animals, animals. Yeah. Uh, where there's, you know, hey, this, I, I cracked open this egg and it's got something in it, or my cow gave birth, or my cow had a miscarriage, or you know we cut open this cow to eat it, and whoops, it turned out this cow was pregnant, it's got a little thing in it. People knew what was going on inside of bodies. They didn't know everything about it. Uh, and plus, uh, you know, describing the fetus as, as being roughly like chewing gum is just kind of describing what it looks like. It doesn't tell us anything about what the fetus is or the process or any of that. So I have yet to hear anything um, from any of the holy books that I could view as, wow, how did they know that? But if I did, if I had heard that, then the position I have to take is, did they know that? Is this a coincidence? How did they know that? And how did it enlighten us at all? Because we didn't know it to be true until we had done the work. So it's completely useless for somebody to include something in a holy book that you still have to go out and prove. Yes, and I called in to the show one time earlier and I spoke to Jen and um, I spoke a little bit about the embryology and this was pretty much the same answer that she gave me. And I accept that. But if I can give you um, some more examples uh, about uh, what are, have now been found to be scientific truths, would it not be plausible to say that this could not have been known at the time um, it doesn't. It does, now. You haven't demonstrated that it was known at the time. The the fact that this is what I was just saying. No, it wasn't known at the time. It, it, okay, give me an example. That'll be easier. Give me an example of the one that you find okay. Im implausible for them to have known at the Can, time. I want to insert something before we go and do this, though. Hold on, just a moment. I had somebody contact me one time about a video where they said that um, it. It was based on the Quran, and the person was making an argument that how the earth had formed was described in the Quran. And it came with graphic video, you know, like illustrations and stuff, and it was basically showing that the core of the earth was iron, and that this had occurred because some sort of iron body had impacted with the earth hard enough to, to go into the center of the earth, somehow didn't destroy the whole thing. 
And they were saying, this is, this is how it's told in the Quran, and this is how the earth is made. Isn't that amazing? And so the first thing I did was go and look up how the, you know, the, the earth's core. And when I looked at the scientific explanation, it had nothing to do with something iron impacting the earth a long time ago. It was about how iron is very heavy and dense and how it would, it would naturally you know, go to the center of, of gravity. And I'm probably butchering it, but the idea was that of all the elements on the planet, iron would be pulled toward the center more than any other, and so you would end up with an iron core. And I kind of thought to myself at the time, when the person made this video saying that this is evidence that in their mind that a god gave people this information and now that I'm looking at it and the information is scientifically inaccurate I'm like it does that mean now that they're going to say that the Quran is bunk because this thing that they're saying is foretold or is, is described in the Quran is is not what they're saying it is what I would probably expect to see is that people would say oh, the model that I came up with was wrong, and that's not really what the Quran was saying, and really it was describing, and then they find where it describes uh, this, the way that the earth had matter that was heavier and more dense and that it ended up in the center. Whatever the scientific theory is going to be, it's just about finding things that kind of sound good enough to fit those models and then using them. And the interesting thing is that scientific theories sometimes change, which I find that fascinating because then what happens to those models in those holy books that are you know describing exactly what science is telling us when science then says hey our model was wrong and and I, okay I, I i would still like you just give the, the one example that you think is like the best example and okay and like i said i'm a skeptic i've seen most of those videos and i don't agree with them because they come with an agenda and they have the conclusion first and they're trying to arrive at it the the example i have is uh of the expanding universe um there is a verse which says that we have built the heaven with power and it is we who are expanding it that's pretty clear i would say I wouldn't say that. I, I have no idea what that verse means. Does that verse necessarily mean that the universe is expanding? I think so. Okay. Um, I don't necessarily and you're, think... And you're saying that it says we are expanding it? Well, that's sort of the language in Arabic. Uh, the royal we. The, the, yes, it's the oh, royal Oh, okay. Yeah, yes. Yeah. And like I said, I'm I'm a skeptic. I'm actually seeking the truth, so I'm not just trying to assert that this definitely sure. means this. I'm, I just want to hear your your view. I get that. So so taking taking that verse, um, I'd I'd have to look at the verse to make sure that we understood it all in context. Because you, when you just pluck out the one verse and says, you know, we created the heavens and we are the ones expanding it. Um, so the it's first thing is one forty seven. Sure, sure. Is Sarah 147? 5147. 5147. So, yes. the first thing is, uh, as I said before, up until we discovered that the universe was expanding, did people know... Uh, <laughs> Wait, now this, inter this uh, translation says, and the heaven we constructed with strength, and indeed we are its expander. I mean, yeah, the universe is translation. The, the sure. universe is often referred to by people as an expanse. I, I mean, I've heard that term in English. Used. Yeah, and that's the problem. Is it, it, I don't necessarily want to get to, to the English and the translations and stuff. First of all, I'm not convinced that it means that so, that somebody was asserting that the universe was necessarily expanding. It could be, you know, the, the common view of expanse or et cetera. But it doesn't matter because. When we learned that the universe was expanding, it was based on discovery and evidence. If it turns out that some claim that somebody made, like, let's say I said, there'll be a woman president of the United States in 2020. If it turns out that I'm correct, does that mean I knew that now? No. Right. So it's a mistake for us to say, Here's this, how on earth could they have known that back when the Quran was written? Maybe the answer is they didn't know that. 
So there's a number of possibilities. It doesn't necessarily mean the, what people are interpreting it to mean. Uh, number two, it may mean that, but they didn't have any good reason for it. It's not, it's not like people haven't looked up at, at the sky and, you know, reached conclusions ahead of time. They, you know, before we understood and knew that there were planets, other planets in our solar system, there were people who were absorbing, uh, observing the heavens and seeing these things moving. And before they knew what they were, they were planets, which is originally, I think, in Latin was wanderer, because they moved around the sky in a different way than some of these others did. And so they, but our modern view of planet is we have a definition for it. The ancient view of planet was just this is the name that we're going to call these things that don't behave like anything else and we don't know anything about them. What are they? And so before someone could get to the point where they had an understanding of planets, they had already made a discovery and were labeling it. Labeling the heavens or the, the sky as an expanse or something that's expanding could have come about by any number of of observations, or it could not. It could be not an observation at all. The answer. The, the answer is we have no idea. So when we ask the question, how did they know that? That's the wrong question. The first question is, did they actually know that? Does this mean what it seems to mean? If in fact they did know it, now the next question is, how did they have this information way before we did? That's and that's a good question. Let's say there was. Let's say you're correct, and this particular sura is. Um, an accurate intended description of an expanding universe and that the author understood that the universe was expanding. How could that person have had that knowledge? And the answer is, we don't know. But when you start listing off the possible explanations, uh, God doesn't make the list because God can't be a possible explanation to demonstrate that there is a God or that God can in fact be an explanation. Maybe, you know, I don't, I don't even know what the possible explanations could be. Maybe there's a doctor who went back and told them. Maybe um, they had access to knowledge and information and, and maybe even technology that w has been lost to time. Maybe it was a wild guess. Maybe it was a coincidence. Maybe this person didn't know it. At no point are we justified in saying, you know what, this is just so implausible that they could have had this information that the only answer we can go to is God because that is by definition a God of the gaps fallacy. I understand that but I wouldn't think that anybody looking up at the sky in the fifth century would have just guessed that it's it could be expanding and the assumption is um, that it has to come from somebody or something that knows way ahead of time. I, I've heard you made this analogy before um, about, especially about the Bible, like why should you believe in the book just because it says it. Um, in the Quran, there, in, in many places it says that we have given you signs and for you to follow the evidence and um, so on and so forth. And, and that's sort of the argument. Um, now, it is also possible that, that this is what it meant. And you're right. It, we, we can't say why or how did they know this. Well, is it, you, you, you say... It is a plausibility, isn't it? How can it be plausible that the best explanation is something for which we have no evidence? I mean, we know people can guess things correctly. We know people can make inferences. Science begins with an observation and then some inferences about possible explanations based on other knowledge, yeah. and then you build from there. So if we know that those things, how could it ever be the case that something that hasn't been demonstrated, for which we don't have evidence, could be the best possible explanation when we already know that people uh, make observations and have inferences and have suspicions about how things might work? Even, even if that passage was about expanding. You know, you, you sit up and you look at the sky and you watch the, the clouds kind of stretch out over time. Isn't that enough to start wondering about the expansion? If you go back, if you go out where you're nowhere near the city lights and you see the Milky Way, they, you know, they, our, our galaxy spread out across the sky as this, um, you, you, you're not going to observe individual stars expanding, but you are going to observe movement. Now, I don't know how anybody could say... I don't know how, what the best explanation is, but I think that an all-powerful, outside-of-time super being that knows everything is a more plausible explanation than 
this was a guess, this was an observation, this was an inference, um, or I'm interpreting it wrong. All of those seem to me I, to be... I don't perfect. think that I could hang my hat on a single word meaning something so profound as what has been robustly described by science at this point. Yeah, one of the to, things... To seek out that one word and say, you know, this must be what this means. It, it's like looking for a needle in a haystack. Yeah, before I mean, we learned that the universe was expanding, would anybody have looked at that verse and reached the conclusion that the universe was expanding? Like, what did they think about it? Did people, why, did, why didn't then, you know, why wasn't this something that Muslims have just been saying for centuries, like since the Quran, that, yeah, the universe is, is constantly expanding, um, you know, it could have given a rate, for example, like a rate of expansion or something more more detailed that would be more uh, robust about it that we could look at and say that this clearly is what it's talking about. And one other thing which has come up many, many times is this. We tend to do these things backwards. Instead, try doing it forward. You're God. You want to reveal a message to people. You are Allah, you are Yahweh, you are whoever, and you have an important message to re reveal to people. First of all, it's absurd to think that they would re reveal it once and once only in languages that can change and texts that can be manipulated. But we'll just assume that they've, they've made that horrific mistake. If you want to tell people that the universe is expanding and you are the cause of its expansion, would you write this verse this way, or would you say, I created the universe. The universe is expanding. It, I'm telling you this information. You will someday discover it to be correct. Here's the information on expanding. If there's, there's a lack of clarity of purpose with regard to this. Here's a question. Wait, I, I have a question, though. Here's a legitimate question for you, Ahmed. If, if science came out with a new model that said it was collapsing, that the universe is actually collapsing and not expanding, would you then consider the Quran to be fatally flawed, that this is wrong, that the passage is wrong, the book is wrong, and that it is incorrect in what it claims? Yes, I would. Really? So you wouldn't, you would not, there's no way that you could think that maybe you've misinterpreted that word expand to mean what, it, what you're thinking it means. I mean, I, I'm saying that the, the, the only reason I am still st sticking to this is because of these things. And if they're proved wrong, I will consider it flawed. And that's a problem, though. Um, because If you're, they you're, were, but I'm talking about this one. No, the, the problem here is that you're saying if these things I'm were sorry, proved I wrong... I don't understand. The problem here is you're saying if these things were proved wrong, I would stop believing. And that's backward. That's not skepticism. Skepticism is not, I'm going to believe this until you prove me wrong. Skepticism is, I'm not going to believe this until it is proven correct. That's skepticism. I guess the, I guess the argument um, or supposition here is that, that here's a book and it says that it's written by God. And God is saying, I am telling you all of this. And so this is why you should believe in me because I'm telling you all of this in advance. And, but you'll find out. If you, if you were God, would you do it that way? I would not. If I was God, I'd just reveal myself to everybody. Yeah, so why are you a better communicator than God? I don't know. Doesn't it seem silly? This is the point that I'm getting. This is actually a good chunk of the book that I'm writing, If I Were God, this notion of how a God might go about revealing itself. Why is it the case that human beings uh, seem to have more empathy, more understanding, more humanity, more intelligence than the God that was in these ancient tomes. If you were to write a new book um, and invent a God, there's no way anybody would invent a God that is as unwise and as closed off as we find in the Bible or the Quran or anything like this. We, we know better. So if we know better, and we are smarter than the God in this book, then what justification is there for calling it a God? No, I agree, I agree with you, and, and there, there's a lot of things that I agree with you. I've been watching your show for ages now. Um, I'm, I, I'm sort of on the fence. I'm not like 100% sure that this is true. It's just like I've moved very, very far away from where I started. Sure. And this is just like sort of the end point. Um, 
There's also, for example, if I may, uh, another verse that says that the heavens and the earth were joined together um, and we split them apart. So sort of coming from the Big Bang, I would say. See, that and seems so vague I mean, to me. Yeah. I, I, I honestly, when I, I understand that what you're saying is that when you read this, it seems so profound to you. But I'm telling you that being on the outside, looking in to this, it doesn't seem that profound. You probably have already looked at other, like Christian claims that are similar to this about the Bible. And I'm sure that when you look at them, you think, oh, this sounds so flimsy. I mean, you sound like a person who would have done that research. Have you already looked at claims like this yes. that Christians make? Yes, I've also looked at things like this uh, that, that Muslims have made. And, and uh, like I said, I've seen all those videos that you were talking about, and I started to look at them from the outside, and I can see that some of them are just saying that after the fact, and it, it well, can be interpreted in that way. So the passage that you were just but talking about, these, the passage that you were just talking about, the heavens and earth were once joined and we split, yes. split them apart, and you want to say that kind of sounds like the Big Bang. It sounds nothing at all right. like the Big Bang, because the universe is 13.7 billion years old, and the Earth is about 4.5 billion years old, roughly, that's the model that we have right now. So the two were never uh, concurrent. And meanwhile, what we describe as the heavens and we describe as the Earth, they're not separate, we're, we're part of that, just like the other planets that are out there in the heavens. Uh, yes, we have an atmosphere, but it's not like there's some hard line with a, a space of nothing in between us and the rest of the universe. We are a part of the universe. So the notion that they were once together um, is true in the sense that they're still together. The notion they were split apart, the heavens and the earth, uh, is false. And any similarity you might find to the Big Bang is absurd because there's nine billion years in between the Big Bang and the formation of the earth. It reminds me a little bit in the Bible when it talks about dividing the, the waters and the, and the land. Yeah. When you look at the planet, you see that there's water and there's land, but when you look at it from a broader perspective, there's land that keeps going under the water. It's not like there's not land there, right? I mean, it's, but it's from a perspective of just sort of when I look out at the planet as a human being, I see there's areas with water and areas that are, don't have water. Um, and so it would be easier for me, like easy for me to mentally divide these things. But in reality, kind of what Matt is describing is the land doesn't stop. Right? It's not like there's this divide between land and water. There's parts where the uh, parts of the land that are covered in water and there's still land. Um, so it, it's, these things are extremely flexible in how people can interpret them. And I think what Matt is saying is that as science starts to come out with things and you start thinking like, oh, this is reminiscent to me as someone familiar with this book of this passage, that's probably true. There probably are passages that it reminds you of. I'm reminded of all kinds of things every day that are just have meaning and connection in my head that don't really connect in reality. Um, I understand that you're at a point, though, where you're just sort of struggling with this. So I don't, I'm not sure that any amount of, um, of us reiterating that it doesn't seem this way to us is going to make that big of a difference. But I will just say that I think that you are listening and I think that you are being sincere in what you're saying, which is one of the reasons yeah. I wanted to go into this call. And I do have other callers, but I want to thank you so much for calling in because I really enjoyed the call and you are welcome to call back in the future. Okay, well, right. um, thank you very much. Yeah, I have thank a you. small other point, if, if I could. Sure. Um, okay, so just to be clear. So, um, by the way, when I speak to Muslims about these verses, I say exactly the things that you're saying. With, like, that this doesn't seem obvious to me, and this mm -hmm. is not, this, it could have been any other way, and now you're just saying this because now we know this. Right. Um, but, so, is what you're saying that... Even if uh, what is said it comports to established science, there is no reason to believe that this is something divine. Yes. That, yeah, that's the point Matt was making. I would just make the point that it's so vague in its, you know, we're, you're talking about a single word. I mean, that's how... But my question is, is it plausible that that could be the case? So... Plausibility is something that tends to be demonstrated. When we're looking through K 
candidate explanations for something. We can only look to things that we know to exist and that we know to be true. If, if, a, if a fire starts and we want to figure out what caused this fire, we can only go through things that we know and understand that could potentially start a fire. If there are fire starting pixies or fairies out there, we don't get to appeal to them as a plausible, possible or probable explanation. The probability needs to be demonstrated, the plausibility needs to be demonstrated and the possibility needs to be demonstrated. It doesn't mean that it's wrong. Right. Maybe there are fire starting pixies. Maybe somebody did it with, you know, the the psychic powers. Uh, maybe there is a god, and he's just not bright enough uh, to be clear in communication. It, this is not about saying you're wrong. There is no god. It's about saying the reasons that you've given for concluding that a god is plausible or reasonable to, as an explanation uh, are insufficient. They're not supported by evidence. They're not reasonable. Yeah. They're not. You're, you're doing skepticism backward to say, and if you wanna, I want to be convinced. And if you want to put those pixies forward, you can do that, but you have to then build a model that's testable. Yeah. Right? So you, you would have to say, I think it's these fire starting, I think it's some supernatural fire starting entity because I'm really not seeing how it could be any other way. Then it's, then it's incumbent on you to figure out a way that we can then add this supernatural cause to the things that exist that can be causes, right? Because now we have, it's like, okay, well, we can go that route, but first we have to show how we're going to demonstrate that this is actually something that exists and can cause fires. So we have to get it added to that category first of things that would be possible explanations that we know, you know, to exist and cause fires. And then we can start looking into whether or not it meets the criteria for how these fires would get started through that method. So it's okay. like, it adds well, a step. I, I, okay, I understand. Well, okay. I don't want to hold up, hold up the show, so... Okay. Um, well, no, you're, I mean... Guys. No, it was a great call, yeah, though. Thank it you. was a great call, and I really appreciate you calling in. Yeah. Me too. Thank you so and, much. And, and I will be coming to the, to the United States in the next few months. I will definitely be flying into Austin just to come. Awesome. Oh, yeah, come that would be out. great. And we I, would and love I, that. May, there's a physicist sitting out here uh, <laughs> that you might want to have a conversation with because I would, I would exercise some caution in saying anything sounds like the Big Bang when <laughs> Big Bang cosmology, uh, it's not like science makes proclamations about truth. Uh, th these things are subject to revision. So if we revise our understanding of the origins of the universe based on better evidence and better models, the Big Bang cosmology might change, and then it might not even seem like it applies to that verse to you. So if you start, if you start hanging your hat on things of, oh, this seems plausible, you're kind of, you're not engaged in the, in the sort of rigid skepticism that says, I want sufficient evidence to justify belief. You're going with, gosh, I really feel like I need to make some decision. I'm really, I don't want to say I don't know, because that seems like, you know, I'm, I haven't really looked at it or I, you know, whatever else. And, and so I'll just go with this for now. Uh, the problem with going with this for now is that if you're wrong, the thing that you believe affects other things that you might believe, and the process by which you came to that belief can definitely affect other things. You know, oh, what's the harm in thinking I have lucky socks? <laughs> Well, it might make you think you have other lucky things, or you might end up in a Jesus take the wheel type situation and end up in a car. Grab your lucky yeah. socks yeah. <laughs> instead of the wheel, yeah. But I appreciate the call a lot. Thank you. Thank you, Ahmed. Uh, uh, thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Have a nice day. You too. Okay, so we're going to go ahead and move right on to Brian in Indianapolis. Hi, Brian. You're on with Matt and Tracy. Brian? Hey, Brian, are you there? Hello. Hey. Hi. Yes, I am. Great. Sorry, I muted. I had my call <laughs> muted. So. Okay, well, we hear you okay. now. <laughs> so you're, you're, you're doing better than I am because I'm supposed to mute <laughs> like when I cough and I keep forgetting. I never remember. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I coughed a few times too and I was paranoid. I thought maybe my mute button was off. The so. problem with our mic system was. is us. Yeah. <laughs> the the technology is wonderful. Well, hey. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, I appreciate uh, the the show, and I also appreciate you accepting my phone call. Um, so I had, uh, well, I'll just say it this way. After 9-11, I experienced what a lot of people, I think, experienced, which is the questioning of their faith. Um, and I was raised Catholic, um, went to a Catholic grade school and then a public high school. And I'd say, you know, we went to church every week and, and did that thing. <laughs> but after 9-11, you know, it just sent my world into a you know, a tizzy a little bit. And so I, I started to explore, you know, or questioning everything. 
And I actually got really far. And I would say I'm still at this point, which was I regard myself as almost an atheist. <laughs> and I also would back that up with the fact that I, I'm a, barely a believer. And the reason I'm, I'm, I'm almost at a holding point, um, and it's because as I started to unpack all the religious you know, stuff that I learned. It was easy to, it was so easy to shoot the, most of the stuff down. You know, evolution, I totally buy into that. I totally buy into Big Bang. I totally buy into almost all scientific, you know, theories, at least the ones that are, you know, consensus driven. So, so what's the last but holdout? I, yeah, well, that's what I want to talk about. So I got, I finally got to the point and I was looking over the, the, what I call the, um, chasm to atheism and and at first i thought it was going to be just a small jump but it ended up get, becoming a big chasm and here's where i came I, I started i the question i asked that i couldn't uh in terms of probability say with um um, um confidence was is there a purpose to the universe and so that i whittled all this down to a point where i said okay in order to and and this may be, I may already be an atheist, by the way. I just. Well, I was going to say, did you come up with a purpose for the universe? I, I was going to ask also, what do you think atheism is? Because it's just, I'm not convinced there's a God. Well, and so, and I, that's the first, and maybe it's because I've, I've been brainwashed into thinking what atheism was or wasn't. But I heard that for the first time on your show, the definition that says that atheism is, um, or people that not, are not convinced there's a God. Right. And what I, always, what I always had the definition of atheism to be is people are convinced there is no God, right. which is a very different thing. It is yeah, different. It's, it's a subset, and it may be the case. Uh, it gets labeled a lot of different things, but we don't have to go through all the labels. If you believe in a God, you're no. a theist. Oh, no. And if you don't believe in a God, you're an atheist or a non-theist. I don't even yeah. care about the label so much as sure. what it is that... So it's this issue of, of purpose. Now, a, yeah. good, a good friend of mine named Chris Johnson uh, did a, a big coffee table book. Uh, I think it's still at theatheistbook.com. And it was... A Better Life. A Better Life. It's like a hundred atheists giving their thoughts on joy and meaning and mm -hmm. purpose in a world without God. And there sure. you get to hear from real people discussing their view on this issue of meaning and purpose. Um, as far as I can tell, there's no intrinsic purpose in the universe. There's no reason to think that the universe was uh, created or has an intent or has any goal or purpose for your life. And that really terrifies some people. Um, no, it doesn't, and it doesn't terrify me. And further, I don't think it's obvious that there's no purpose. And the reason why, and, and I'll say this kind of definitively and then we can, Discuss it more in more detail. Well, well you just there is an, you, you just said what's that? You just said that you don't think it's obvious. There's no purpose, and my point wasn't right. there's no purpose. My point was I don't see any reason to think there is a purpose. So we're, we're the right. same thing I, with regard to a god as we are with a purpose. Purpose no, it would need no, to be demonstrated. I would say, no, I would say there's a there is no greater than a fifty percent chance that the universe has a purpose than if it doesn't. Okay, so I don't know how you're doing math or why you're doing math. The point is, right. if there is a purpose to the universe, that's something that should, would have to be demonstrated. Right. And the time to believe well, there's a purpose is after it's been demonstrated. Exactly. And that's exactly my point. So, and again, I'm not, I, I'm struggling with this. He, I, I think yeah, these, these are concepts. I, I'm not going to beat you up over the language. <laughs> right, I'm just right. trying to make sure we're clear. Yeah. I understand. Well, so let me give you, yeah, no, I, I and I'm, I'm completely... Uh, in alignment with you. And I got to this point. I Welcome got to, to atheism. To point, what you just said. Well, but here, here's the thing, though. Here's where I, I'm still stumbling. Is that, and, and this is a, a really simple and probably silly analogy. But, you know, with regard to purpose, I was, I, you know, I was a deep in thought and I was watching a bird, uh, as silly as that sounds, pick up sticks. And I thought, I know what that purpose is. I know why that bird is, it's not because he loves sticks. He's not, he's not collecting sticks and putting them in a scrapbook. The bird is actually building a nest. Now, so to me, 
and you said it exactly, a purpose cannot be known until it is revealed. And so there is no, there is just as much evidence to me that the universe is working towards a purpose than there is its meaningless and not going anywhere. Because there's I don't time. I don't understand that. I, I... Well, did, did you hear the, do you understand what I'm saying about the bird instance where if you look at a bird. A bird, a bird, middle, can, a bird can have purposeful action and that tells me nothing about whether there's some intrinsic purpose to the universe. Nothing. Exactly. Well, no, no, no. My analogy is this. I'm, I'm not saying that the bird proves <laughs> there's such purpose to the universe. What I'm saying is the universe could be in the same as we are today, as we exist today. We don't see a purpose, right? It's not obvious to us, but maybe there is an end game for which we have no clue about. Yeah, that yeah, but will materialize so, in so, the future. So sure. So the time to believe there's a purpose is after it's actually materialized. But the thing is, I, I, don't, I could never say there's just as much evidence for something as against it when I don't see any evidence for it. I see no, well, no, I, no evidence for this notion that the universe has some intrinsic purpose. Because what pur about evolution? Evolution doesn't have a purpose. Evolution, How do you know that? Evolution doesn't... Okay. Isn't, <laughs> Because evolution is a change in allele frequencies over time, evolution is random mutations that are Im impacted by natural selection, the forces around this. It's, right. Evolution isn't right. moving towards a goal. This is all definitional within evolution. Evolution is not moving towards a goal, which means there's no purpose. I don't see that. That's where I'm sitting there thinking, how can you, because there is no, we aren't to the end game necessarily of you, evolution. You, the, okay, you, well, you're assuming game? there is an end game. That you don't get to assume there is an end game because that, by definition, is assuming that there's a goal or purpose. Well, my point is, is that if we argued about probabilities, or or let's just say, well, probability is the best word, whether or not there is a purpose or isn't. Okay, I think I could argue based on and i think i view and this is this is probably just a world view perspective is that when i look at evolution i think it's going somewhere okay that's now first of all not, first of all now, first of all it's that's false second of all that's an opinion not an argument for something well right i'm not a scientist right Clearly. i well no I, and i don't mean that I, derogatorily i, I mean no, no, we're yeah, talking about well this. i think this is, i'm not a scientist this either the problem yeah, and this is, I think this is the problem with what I'm having with um, a lot of... Um, what, what do you, what do you think the purpose it. of evolution is? I think, it, well, I don't know. Well, All okay, is, this is, the, this is the thing. This is the thing. You're saying you are convinced that evolution is moving towards a goal. Why? No, I'm not convinced. No, I'm not convinced. I swear you just... I'm, no, no, I said there's a 50% chance that evolution is moving toward a goal and there's another 50 percent so it's a flip of the coin now now, now earlier you and, said that there was e either evidence with regard to the universe having a purpose i thought just a couple minutes ago you said no, that no. you you were convinced that evolution had a purpose which is why i said that was an no. opinion i'm pretty sure that no, you did but we'll just i'm pretty sure that you did we yeah. can always rewind and well, check I didn't mean but but let's just yeah, toss I, it out i didn't mean it so, I, I just, so you think there's a let me clarify. There's a you think there's a fifty percent chance that evolution has a purpose. I don't know why you're putting a number on it. That's correct. I don't but either. what I'm asking over and over again is, what do you think the purpose is, and why do you think there's a purpose? I don't know. I don't know what the purpose is. All I know okay. is there could be a purpose. Then I'm, I, I apologize, but, but I'm not power. interested in opinions where people are going to spout numbers and say right. this is what I'm convinced of, and when I ask them why they're convinced, they say I don't know. There's no discussion there. Well, yeah, and I understand exactly what you're saying. The, the, the problem I'm getting hung up in is to make a decision on whether or not there's a purpose in the universe depends on me uh, being confident that there is no purpose. See, and, and I, that's, that's, that's what I'm saying. That, that you, you're doing the same thing with regard to purpose that you were previously doing with regard to God. You're not going to be an atheist until you're convinced there is no God. The point is, you should not believe that there's a purpose right. until it has been demonstrated there is. You should not be sitting in a position... You should, 
What if we are? What if we're not? There's no reason to believe that we are, is the point. point. So the point is, you should not believe... If I have absolutely no reason to believe that something is the case, why would I say that it has a 50% chance of being the case? The only reason that you're... we don't know everything. Okay, (laughs) agreed. But that doesn't make it just as plausible as not being the case when there is zero evidence that it is the case. Well... So it's like saying me, that there's a 50 percent atheism. OK, so let me ask let me ask you a question about atheism, because I'm willing to proudly tout that I'm an atheist. But here's the thing I hang on to. And if um, and there is to me, it's the possibilities of things, one of which. So I look at possibilities. Nobody more. there is no requirement for anybody to 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 give up possibilities. The, the, it, w- here's what happens. Okay. If okay. you if you if you give up the possibilities, you are asserting that something is impossible, which is even stronger right. than asserting that you believe it's false. You're saying it's impossible. Right. No, n- there is right. no requirement within First of all, atheism has no requirements. It is simply I am not convinced there is a god, or in some cases I okay. believe there is no god. But even if you were convinced as I am, as many people are, that there are no gods or that the gods that have been proposed aren't actually real. That doesn't mean that you're convinced that it's impossible. So nobody's asking anybody to give up possibilities. But what what I am saying is, if you're just going to try to sit in this weird limbo of, oh, well, let me not commit, because uh, nobody's asking you to commit to anything, because I don't know whether we're in the middle of the end game or the possibilities. It's all, it's it's chaos. I don't know what's going on. Then you you don't know. And by definition, you cannot be convinced. So, so I think the the, the um, thing I I achieved clarity is is this definition that I was not familiar with, which was atheism is being not convinced there is a god, which counters to what I've heard by <laughs> theist um, from my theist friends that atheism is being convinced that there is no god. Yeah, imagine what I'm that. You say <laughs> right? Well, well, yeah. And so it's because it's because it's because from the theist perspective, it needs to be portrayed as you need to make a choice. You either choose, for example, Jesus in life or you choose the devil and destruction. You need to believe to know that you know that you know that you know that Jesus Christ is your Lord and that there's a God or you are in absolute denial and denying all possibility and arrogantly presuming that you know everything. The atheist position, the non-theist position is the least arrogant of all positions because I don't think I'm a special creation. I don't think I'm a special creation. I'm not asserting knowledge that I don't have. I'm not demanding that people take unskeptical positions on anything. I am unconvinced of a God and I am only willing to be convinced if there's good argument and good evidence and simply saying well we don't know or it may be possible or we could be none of that is good enough evidence to believe in any of that and i I completely subscribe to that philosophy so i guess i'm an atheist awesome okay (laughs) issue (laughs) issue resolved well here's one if you you have a minute the other thing i i i would argue and and uh, and now I'm I'm a, let's say I'm pro- proclaiming I'm an atheist, but I do argue still that I don't know that we're better off in a world of atheists than we are with a b- world of theists. Sure, I don't know either. There is no. Okay, and so if you think that can be, I, that, I am that convinced though that we I am convinced though that we would be better off in a world full of secular humanists than we are with a world full of people with competing religious ideas that uh, are conflicting and anti-human. Yeah, I don't know. In the in the, I think it might be a zero sum game, is what I think, because I I participate in and see, and I don't know if um, you know, I don't know what your exposure is to all the beautiful things that theists do. Now, the argument is, well, wouldn't secular humanists do the same thing? Well, they do do so, the same things. Well, but but here's my problem with that statement: is there's more evidence that theists do more of those things. No, 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 no. I mean, this is, the, this is the problem. This is the problem. This is lying with statistics. The fact that there are more <laughs> religious people, the, the fact that there are more religious people who have had a pre- preferential privileged status I- in the West in particular for a longer period of time, the fact that people have been motivated to, to do things by their church organizations and things like that is irrelevant. You can't, it's like saying, Donald Trump has more money than me. There's evidence that Donald Trump has more money than me. Well, he started with more money than me. 
Okay, you can't you can't assume someone's value and contribution just based on the raw dollar amount. Well, if in if in fact Trump has uh, not made nearly as much money as he thought or not increased at a rate that I have, then I'm a better earner. Like if we go to a country where most people are secular, most people who donate to charities and do good works are going to be secular. I mean, that's not even really an argument. It's just an observation. Yeah, you know, it's the, the fact there are, there are more religious people. So you can't go by the raw number. And, and yes, I understand Just that like even if... there are more theists in prison, right? Yeah, like, it, I mean, even if you go to percentages, though, you can say, ah, religious people per capita donate more or do more or whatever. You still have to take into consideration that until very, very recently, there weren't opportunities for secular humanist charities sure. to even have a, an audience to reach out to. It's such a small pool, and they don't have... This, we don't enjoy the same tax-free uh, status that religions do. We have to apply as, for nonprofit status as a educational organization or as right. a library. We don't just get a de facto this. We're also not coming on and uh, you know passing the plate and telling people that if they give us money, they'll get rich or we'll donate to the poor. What percentage of the money that goes to charitable uh, efforts within churches actually gets to the recipients? You don't know because churches have the privileged position of not having to open their books to the public. Is it one penny out of your dollar that actually gets to the needy or is it 99? You don't know. Yeah, I guess I'm, I'm seeing it from a pure um, uh, um, mission. You know, I've gone on mission trips and I've done. So there, I, I'm, I'm definitely speaking from my own experience. Sure. I, I've, I've seen it from and both seeing, sides. I, I, yeah, I went on mission well, trips. Yeah. Well, it reminds me of Rebecca Vick. Fitzum. Like, that's yeah. what I think of right away. Yeah. So there was a woman in the atheist community who her house was destroyed by, I think it was a tornado, and Wolf Blitzer was on site doing reporting, and he went to interview her and asked her, don't you just thank God that you and your family got out alive when you look at this stack of toothpicks behind you that was your house? And she was just like, yeah, no, you know, I, I really just kind of am glad that we're okay. And, and he's yeah, like, like, yeah, actually, but don't, he goes, but don't you just thank God? And yeah. she goes... That's I'm not an what I'm talking about. She goes, I'm an atheist. Not even close. Well, wait a minute, you didn't let me finish. She says, I'm an atheist. Okay. Now, what Rebe Rebecca went on to do is she has started a first responder group, a secular first responder group that goes to emergency sure. areas and offers emergency services, kind of like the Red Cross, except it's all secular. So this was a woman who well, herself now, yeah. went through this situation, saw that how you know, there's all this assumption and there's all these religious groups doing these 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 situations, and, and doing like, it wrong. Yeah, she's like, where is the secular community here? And so she <laughs> stepped up and she inserted the secular community, and she created an organization that is now active in this. And there's atheists helping <laughs> well, atheists helping the homeless and feminists right. at work here in Austin all the time doing stuff. I'm sure there is. I'm sure that I'm not. I'm not here. Not here to argue that there are some atheists that are doing things. That's there the are point. some Christians who are doing things. That's not so, the point. Right. I know. That's so. Here's my <laughs> right. I'm dealing with the fact that I believe it might be a zero sum gain in that either way you are going to end up with bad people and good people. Of course. And religion <laughs> does not religion does not create more bad people than good people. I disagree oh, with I that. Oh, I disagree with that, too. Well, yeah, I disagree. And, see, that's, and there, that's there's, a famous, yeah. there's a famous quote from Weinberg that says, uh, without religion, good people would do good things, and bad people would do that bad things, but right. it takes something like right. religion to convince good people to do bad things. Yeah, my religion tried no. very hard no, you to, just say no. to okay. get me to adopt all kinds yeah. of heinous well, here's, views here's, and beliefs here's, about here's, people and well, prejudices, and there are people who adopt those things and who go out and promote those things, even though they think, I don't think this is right, but God knows better than I do, so I go ahead and just say, gay people you know, shouldn't be allowed to get married because that's yeah, what my yeah. church says. Hang on, hang on, no, 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 here's, here's no, 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 no. Hang, hang on, hang on. Okay, okay, yeah. When a kid comes to us and says that when he told his parents he was an atheist, they kicked him out of the house and we have to find him a new house, do you think there's any strong likelihood that those parents would have kicked that kid out of their house if it weren't for the religious instruction they believed? Do you guys realize how rare that is? Do you realize in our mail how not rare that is? Do you know how in the secular community it's zero? No, are you yeah. telling me? Are you zero. Telling me that you have every no, no, no. Listen, are you telling me you have every case of every uh, a religious person that kicked their kids out because they said they were atheists, and you can compare that to all the parents that embraced that 
and um, what you're hearing. Wait, you were no, asking. No. You were asking about whether we believed religion could get people to do bad things, and Matt is giving you an example. Oh no, 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 no! I agree. I agree. It does. That is religion but, motivating a parent to do something a parent should never do just because of what their child thinks. Is there well, any? Is what there I'm any? Saying, what I'm saying is there's more positive. It doesn't matter. This is lying with statistics again. You can't go to the more. No. You, you well, have no, to do no, a no, comparison. That's what, but no, 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 fucking no. What in, secu what in secular humanism could ever encourage people to do bad things? Uh, I don't know secular humanism. Then you should look. But, uh, what I, because well, I, I find that there's nothing within secular humanism that can encourage people to do bad things. And yet I have yet to see a single religion that doesn't include encouragement for people to do bad things. Not one. Let me. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I get it. I get it. Um, let me ask you one more question and then I'll let you go because I know you've got some other folks to talk to. Um, one of the things that I I look to in, in understanding human uh, you know, progress and evolution is ways that we develop to, to um understand each other. And one of the things that I think is profound that I haven't seen any other, uh, uh, you know, whether it's uh, atheist or um, religions, is talk about forgiveness in a sense. And I, I guess I was wondering what your thoughts are. Somebody emailed and asked me about this how, just the other day. Yeah. What, what, what's your thoughts around forgiveness and how it... There's absolutely became, nothing, there's nothing about forgiveness that is incompatible with secular humanism. It, secular humanism is, is based on the idea that we are in this world, we don't get to appeal to a god, we have to find a way to live cooperatively and to create a better, more productive society. If in fact it is shown, and I think it has been, that there are benefits to forgiveness. There are benefits to, I, if I forgive someone, I no longer have maintained that, that, uh, that strife within my life, it benefits me, it can potentially benefit that person. We know this to be the case, and so there's encouragement for forgiveness in secular humanism. Yeah. Well, how about on a more extreme scale of forgiveness? What about on an extreme scale? I, I don't. I don't. I didn't even well, give it. Well, I didn't even give a scale. Right. I just said that. For, I <laughs> well, said I'm fine with forgiveness, and so is secular humanism. And then you want to say what about on an extreme scale? Well, no, like, my like what? It was more about how how it came about. How, how, how what came about? about? I when, tell you exactly how forgiveness comes about. I forgive you. Yeah. That's it. <laughs> that makes no sense. Because you don't, what is forgiveness? That is, when I say that I forgive you, that means I am no longer going to hold your action against you and I'm not going to bottle up in me to where it affects my life. Forgiveness That's what forgive is me. a pragmatic action in a social group. If we all decided that every time, revenge is a, is a very detrimental action in a social group. There are small social yep. groups where there are actually like family revenge cycles going on where they kill almost every yeah. member of every family. Revenge is not right. a good idea. And forgiveness is kind of a requirement if you're going to have a social group. Otherwise, eventually everyone's going to leave because you're going to have a problem with someone and not forgive them and then not cooperate with them and everyone walks away. So you have what a it, murder. How about murder? Oh my gosh! <laughs> what difference does it make? Well, no, no. Let's look at a, a particular case where uh, my wife is murdered right. by another person. Sure. Do you think it's it makes the most? It makes pragmatic sense to let that criminal to forgive that criminal and let them go on with their life. Who says let them go on with their life? You're talking about forgiveness, which is simply not holding, you know, a grudge against them for what they did. It doesn't mean that you ignore what they did. It's not mean. Doesn't mean we're, you know, we're not going to lock up somebody who's <laughs> dangerous or, or in, engage in. Well, act. no, no, no. I'm talking about what forgiveness really is, which is, it's more than just. Um, um, not having a grudge. If you're um, saying no, that forgiveness saying. is taking people who are a demonstrated like threat with a high potential for recidivism and just letting them out in the general population, that would be a hideous thing. Not. Okay, well then I don't understand well, what yeah. you're saying. When you start talking about what forgiveness really is, I already talked about forgiveness yeah. and gave you an example. Is my, is my understanding of forgiveness wrong? Yeah. Okay, yeah, what so is forgiveness then? <laughs> forgiveness... <laughs> Well, I mean, it, I don't think we can go into it. In a, oh, well, then in goodbye. A short yeah. time. Then goodbye. No, I'm just telling I, you. You don't, no, get to tell me, you don't get to tell me. You don't get to pretend 
Oh, uh, okay, that okay, that okay, okay. we didn't answer your question and that we got it wrong. You either tell us what we're wrong about on the forgiveness or I'm done. Yeah, and we need to move on to some other yeah. calls, so we're going to let you go. But okay. thanks for calling, Brian. All right. Okay. Right. Okay, so. Oh, did we get the calls back? There we did. There were, I was afraid we lost them. They told me it looked fine on their end. So as far as I know, then this would be Sam in New York. Sam, you're on with Tracy and Matt. Oh, hi. How are you, Tracy? Good. How are you? Good. I'm great, thank you. Just wanted to um, basically say that for the last few months, actually beginning of this year, I've been on a constant diet of your show. I've been watching it for a few years, but now I've been constantly watching it. I was born in Kashmir in India, a very deeply uh, religious uh, city. Um, but then, you know, I just a quick, brief um, you know, background, so I just voluntarily on my own actually discarded religion around the age of 16, 17, and I just haven't looked back since. And so this, this place, the, your show, and you guys are actually my home now. Awesome. Well, thank you so much. Thank you. I did email you, but you have such a high volume of emails but I'm sure that it's impossible to answer. Now you get email. to talk to us in person. <laughs> thank you so much. <laughs> okay. Thank you very much for having me, and thank you very much for allowing me to talk to you. Um, you know, one of the things I actually felt, which is maybe a little counterintuitive that I actually wanted to bring to your notice, was that I actually, even in... Uh, Kashmir was actually, uh, is actually Sufi Islam, which, is, which was at one point uh, much less... Her, rapidly fundamental or rapidly, you know, um, religious, I should say, than, um, than other versions. But, you know, it still is. Every single aspect of life in Kashmir is affected by religion. So you can't really have friends. You can't go to anyone's place. Everything is completely and totally ruled uh, by the religiosity. So, is there an explicit theocracy in Kashmir? I'm not. I'm not. No, no. Okay. Kashmir is one of the states in India, so there is no theocracy. So it's one of the northernmost states in in Kashmir. It's uh, it's uh, run by the democratic, uh, by a, a democratic government. So, so what you're talking about is essentially um, you, culturally. You, you, culturally, you can't escape the influence of Sufi Islam. No, you can't. I mean, it was Sufi Islam before the whole world started boiling over, uh, starting from the Middle East, and then this, then the deeply puritanical version, the Wahhabi Islam also um, spread. It's, it's, it's out of the scope of this, this, of this show to get into the reasons for that. But anyway, I found it such a huge relief to discard this tremendous burden that I had on my shoulders. Ever since I was a little kid, you know, you, you, you start getting your you know, adolescence and then you start looking at girls and you felt so guilty. Oh no. Then you can't, and then you can't really, you know, and then one, and as soon as I discarded it about 16, 17 before medical school, I felt such a huge, tremendous uh, sense of relief. So I just wanted to just tell that to people that actually are still teetering on the edge, edge, so to speak, that it is, uh, it's a major... Like Ahmed. <laughs> yeah. You, you can be free of the guilt and shame imposed upon you I, by... Did religion. you happen to I, I have, hear the I'm, call? From Ahmed? Yes. Did, what is your thought about the verse? The expansion verse? No, I actually verse. researched it. I, I, am, I, I researched it, and, and if, if you look at different uh, versions of uh, different translations uh, online, the, the verse means completely different things and completely different uh, translations. So it's not so, convincing for you? No, absolutely not. I'm, I'm happy to report that I have no vacillations or in... Okay. in, in uh, you know, or I was just curious because you had a Muslim background, and he had, you know, he was Muslim, and he was looking at other what other Muslims were claiming, and they that wasn't convincing, but he was convinced by this, and now you're an ex-Muslim, and you're like, I'm not convinced by that. It's just very interesting no, to me. Not, I'm not convinced at all by by anything, by any religious text, uh, including you know, uh, including the one I was born with. And I remember asking my brother uh, when I was small. You know, how, where, did, where did this come from? He said, God made it. And I said, where did God <laughs> come from? And he had no answer for me. A snack. <laughs> so, it was, so he had basically, and then, it, it was, it, I'm sorry, Matt, go ahead. No, no, no I, I thought you were bright because I, normally I, I don't 
check messages or email or anything else, but somebody pointed me to this. We actually already have an email from somebody about that specific passage who referenced seven different translations. Uh, exactly. This comes from Stephen, and I, I just run through them real quick. So the Sahi International, it's and the heaven, and the heaven we constructed with strength, and indeed we are its expander. Then there's the Pickthal translation, which is, we have built the heaven with might, and we it is who make the vast extent thereof. So that's expanse is extent. Yeah. Yusuf Ali, with power and skill did we construct the firmament, for it is we who created the vastness of pace, but I think that's probably space. Uh, or maybe it's pace for expanse. Shakir, and the heaven we raised it with high, with power, and most surely we are the makers of things ample. Muhammad Sarwar, we have made the heavens and our, with our own hands, and we expanded it. Mushan Khan, uh, with power did we construct the heaven, verily we are able to extend the vastness of space thereof. Yeah. And the Arbery one is, and heaven, we built it with might, and we extend it wide. So well, the, this when is, it says exactly. expanded, it reminds me of um, when you talk about a table and you say you put out a spread, right? Like you spread, you put the spread out, basically yeah. you just spread it out. And it's one of those things where, on the one hand, if, if there's a verse, and it doesn't matter whether it's coming from the, the Quran or the Bible or whatever holy book, there are some things that are, that are poetic. Um, and there are some things that are metaphorical or allegorical, etc. And if you try to turn to those things as if they are a literal uh, intent, you also run the risk of be, uh, uh, interpreting it in view of your own perception and your own time and all these other things. And it's, it seems to me that if there were a God, and this was a point I kind of made earlier, that at a minimum, the things that were clear statements about facts should be clear statements about facts and never could, never could they possibly be viewed as poetic uh, or as you know, some sort of uh, idiom or a figure yeah. of speech type thing. Yes. I have just, just so you know, from, from experience with elders, they have always quoted different verses, and one of the verses that they're very fond of uh, quoting is, and God created man from the, again, it's man, not humankind, you know, it was very male right. um, <laughs> and God created man from a clot of blood. So since I learned in my embryology that this is really not a clot of blood, it's actually a, a fusion of a sperm and an egg and a zygote, I've been contra contradicting them, but it doesn't really make sense each time to them because they say you have to read it in context. Yeah, so, so yeah. this you don't you take so make, literally, yeah. right? Yeah, like this one you just have yeah. to kind of be a little flexible with it when it's not exactly. right. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> we need to massage the text so it fits the science. And that's the other thing yeah, is exactly. that if there was something scientific there, it, di it still failed to enlighten anyone. It wasn't until after we discovered it independently uh, that yes, we... Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Hundred percent. Well, uh, and also people seem to think that God is a giant dietitian watching from above everybody's food habits, what he's eating. Make sure you don't eat pork. Make sure you don't eat <laughs> right. shellfish, as Matt, Matt, Matt is fond yeah. of saying. Uh, the question I had actually, one of the reasons was, sometimes I look at the, the more than seven billion people in this uh, in this uh, on this planet Earth. And I, and I get a sense of despair that how can we reach? And there are people, Christians, Muslims, you know, and Jewish people, Hindus, that are procreating like crazy and are, and are creating a whole new slew of people, uh, younger minds, that they are committing thought crimes with at the, since the time of their birth and doing stuff and putting stuff in their brains and telling them how to think and I have a very, very good friend, and I'm, I'm sorry to say this, is that I have kind of gone off him because he has four lovely kids and completely brainwashing them from, from the moment they were born. Well, obviously not from the moment they were born, but right. you know, at the time they had any cognitive sure. um, thought. And so don't you, my, 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 I needed some help in, maybe you guys can shed some light into this. How do you deal with that? that sense of despair that we're fighting a losing battle in spite of the fact that they're allegedly, definitely, I think they're definitely more atheist than before. I just look at it like I'm going to go down fighting. 
right? I mean, if yeah. we can't win it, I'm going to go down fighting. And if we can win it, we'll only win it by fighting. You know, and this is yeah. metaphorical. Let me just make that point because there's always someone yeah. that wants to yeah. twist it. I mean, you know, fighting with ideas and, and fighting with uh, reason. I'm also not convinced we're losing. I, I'm not convinced we're remotely losing as a number of non-theists. Yeah, um, certainly there are problems. I, I, I recommend, always recommend uh, Stephen Pinker's book, The Better Angels of Our Nature, and, and I've heard his new one is good too, although there's some fighting about it. But at the end of the day, I don't think we're losing. Uh, I think th there's a vacillating trend that moves towards not only atheist normalcy, but a decline in religion and superstition. However, we are certainly dealing with you know, like we're back to dealing with flat earth stuff, which is just ridiculous. We, there's so much information available and so much distrust available and so much of a power vacuum that we're now prone to conspiracy theories and you can find an expert to reference your side of almost anything. Um, but I completely agree with, with Tracy. Uh, I'm not convinced that we're necessarily losing, but even if we are, the only option is to continue to work to make it better because when you can't change minds, you change the world around those minds, and you try to do to build the sort of world such that the next generation and the one after that and the one after that has more opportunity to escape from that sort of thinking. Yes, I guess I needed to hear that. <laughs> I'm not I, I'm not overly pessimistic, but I just look around and I'm and I'm very happy where I am. I'm not uh, upset about it. I am incredibly happy in in my own convictions in the community, in the atheist community at large. And uh, I just, I guess I just needed to hear that. I, I would also say that I have, um, I have some family connections who uh, were involved in a religion that is sometimes looked at as fringe among Christians. And they were doing sort of this thing with raising the children in it and whatnot. And it turned out that one of them had a child that grew up and she decided to become skeptical and now she has deconverted most of her family. Oh, good. So yeah. I, I do, I do agree with you. I, I think I, frustrating is probably the word that I would use. And it was frustrating yes. when I found my way out of religion to realize that not only had it taken me so long, but that I found myself now in a world where something that was obviously flawed was believed by so many. And it was so robust that it was very difficult. Uh, it's, it, you know, it's very, very rare we're going to end up having a conversation that's going to change somebody's mind in you know, however long the call is. Yeah. Um, but it is about that keeping an eye on the goal and to realize that the frustration is easy to understand at an individual level and to, and to get pessimistic towards. Uh, but the data that we have, as far as I can tell, shows improvement. And in agreement with Tracy, even if it didn't show improvement, I don't know any other way forward. <laughs> right. So at the end of the day, I think we're winning, but I also think I have incredible job security. <laughs> yes. That, that I'm going to be I'm going to be engaging in these discussions and debates until the day I die. Exactly. I I I I I, I understand I understand it completely, and I it, it's very very. It, it is so refreshing to speak to like-minded people. The, the friend that I was talking about who's raising uh, his uh, kids is, is not Muslim, by the way. I, it's, he's, he's, a, he's a Christian friend of mine. And it is, you know, it's like I could almost not, I, I don't empathize with that. I could almost understand that if you're in a third world country where there's, access to education and, and the latest stuff and, and, and good schools and ubiquitous internet is, is lacking. I could understand these little kids being brought up in, in some madrasa or in some temple uh, being brainwashed. But here in the U.S. to have that happen is, in my opinion, and I don't, it sounds judgmental, but I think that's very, it's very discouraging and frustra frustrating. Let me use the word. Let's, let me use Matt's more suggested word, frustrating. Yeah, I think yeah. in the last couple of years, I found myself more frustrating on a, on a, frustrated on a political bent than on a religious bent. Uh, <laughs> yes. but, but I'm going to continue yeah. focusing on the thing that I, I understand best. Yes. Well, keep okay. fighting the good fight. All right. Thank you, guys. Sure, thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you my call. Sure, thanks for Good calling. You guys. Thank All right, bye-bye. Bye -bye. All right, I'm going to take this one just because I want to end on a fun note. So this is going to be um, Chris 
in Boise. Hey, Chris. Hi, Chris. You're talking to Matt and Tracy. Hey, hey. Hey, how are you guys? Good. 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 Okay. Um, so uh, I was basically just calling it. So I'm a, a Christian, and um, I, you know, I can't give any like direct evidence um, for God, but I feel like there. Well, I think that there is a uh, a strong evidence that we can see by, you know, I'm sure you guys have heard it that we think God's thoughts after him. So there's like this universal need for um, love, justice, order, peace. And basically it's just derivatives of his nature that have been uh, transferred to us human because we're in the image of God. Okay, so this is what we, you believe. On his like, yeah, we take on his likeness. So th that's my, I mean, that's what I feel is the Is God horny? Strongest evidence that he, what was that? Is God horny? Because <laughs> I think horny thoughts, and if I'm thinking horny thoughts after God's likeness, does that mean that God's horny? Well, I know, but you're, you're referring to something that's a physical, um, I, I'm saying there's, there's something deeper, the the need to, for like how you love your wife or daughter, or these are like derivatives of his nature. Sure. How could we know but that? You, how could, I mean, um, I know it's been said and I know you well, believe it, well, but we, I'm, can have, we can see it. I mean, it's, it's no, 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 need. no, no. Okay. I agree with you that we think so. I let let's pick one. How about love? We are we good with that? Okay. Okay. Yeah. I agree that I have love and that I experience love. That I love people. How can I know that yeah. I'm experiencing that after God? Well, because it's um, it, it's something that's innate within you. Like okay, you, is, is, but that doesn't then it's that innate to Matt. Question. Then that would mean. I mean, if it's innate to Matt, then why would you think it was uh, something from a God if you think it's innate to him? Well, I'm saying it's universal. It's within every human being. Right, because we're like, social animals. Sure. <laughs> right, well, you, you, you've okay. now successfully described humans. I'm asking what makes you think that these are indicative of a God, that we're getting it from a God, that we're thinking this after God. You came in with a really uh, nifty kind of uh, footprints style of message, and I'm asking, that's yeah. what you believe. Why would we believe it? Um, okay, well, I, it's just, um, let's see. So I, I start with that point with, you know, the we think, you know, all these are, are um, derivatives of, of God. And you then, can't start with that point. That's the finish. That's the. That's, that's the what point. we're trying to establish. How do you get to that point that you think these things are derived from a god? So me saying that every every human being and the world, like this, is a global, like universal. First of all, that's not true. But all, these, but but basically, well, you don't think these are all like. But I'm saying these aren't all. You don't think there are people like, that don't experience love. That there are um, people with, with, that. with particular psychopathies that are abnormal, that don't experience. So I'm just saying it's not necessarily ubiquitous. But even to the extent that it's ubiquitous, yeah. if, every, if every human being experienced love... That would be a human attribute. That's a human attribute. How do you tie that to God? Okay. Well, I mean, that's... I, I, huh. I mean, I, I don't... I guess I can't. Yeah, I would think that your, your line of reasoning here, and I'm just going to guess from many years of doing this, is I have no other explanation for why all human beings would experience love except that this is what God wants us to experience. Okay. He's asking. Is that close to how your thoughts went? Yeah, I mean, I'm just, I'm just looking at, like, okay, justice, order, um, like, why, why do we have these desires within because we have empathy and right. we have to share space with other people well we're social too i mean if we weren't a social species if we were more like you know foxes or snakes we would probably experience this to a much lesser degree but as a social right, species more. we experience these things like most other social species experience them okay 
So well, I, I, I have to sit to here and I have to forward. share space with Tracy. And believe me, it's not a have to. It's <laughs> Tracy's my favorite person on the show. So I, this is one of my favorite <laughs> okay. weeks ever. But Tracy and I have to yep. share space. And so the, even if we don't fully understand the motivations, there are entirely pragmatic, secular justifications for the how and why we interact. There's the, the game theory questions where we're trying to study this stuff and the prisoner dilemmas and all this stuff. But at the end of the day, even if I was completely selfish, the selfish thing okay. for me to, to care about is to make a world that benefits me. And it benefits me to encourage cooperation, to encourage right. these sorts of emotional things, to, to encourage a sense of justice, to encourage the forgiveness that we talked about, to discourage revenge. Those things, there are pragmatic justifications for them. But even if we had no known okay. justification, what justification would we ever have for saying these are necessarily or even likely the result of a god? Well, why, why are all these equal to uh, a positive outcome? Like, why are the... Because the, that's the goal? I guess that's what I'm trying to express here is like, why the, do wait, these why is, equal what? something that's like by you seeking out justice, by you, you trying to uh, get along well with her? Yeah. Well, I guess... I mean, that's the goal. Well, what he's explaining is that number one, even like, even if he wasn't motivated, okay. it would be self-serving, right? Like it's still self-serving even if he doesn't want to do it. He sees the benefit to doing it. Right. But what I'm well, saying, we're explaining, we're, we're talking about something within, like, so if the world has certain, like, it's like a video game, like, you know, there's there's certain um, variables, and why do the just like seeking justice, love, they they equal to like a positive outcome. Does that make sense? It's so just I, about, I, I mean, it, what you're calling a positive outcome is surviving and thriving. And if animals didn't want to survive and thrive, they probably wouldn't have made it this far on the planet by now, right? An animal that doesn't want to survive and doesn't right. show I any know, propensity still, toward thriving. You, right, but you're still explaining something. Huh. I'm trying to You're looking at the it, outcomes like, of the successes of evolution so far. See, if you and, list the things that benefit us. And then say, why do they benefit okay. us? A sense of justice benefits us. And you're saying, why okay. does a sense of justice benefit us? Th that's not even a why question. It's just a fact that this does, in fact, benefit us. Like, you might as well be asking, know, but you might as well be, you might, you, might as, you might as well be asking, why does food make me feel good? Yeah, why don't I eat poison instead of an apple? Right? Be, right. Because I don't want to die. And because okay. that's, I mean, if I wanted to die, I would eat poison it's just instead a physical of an fact. apple. It's a physical fact of the universe. An apple contributes to my well-being. Drinking battery acid does yeah, not. Right. To say why that's the, the way but, it but is. But this, is, isn't, this isn't a human thing. This is an every species thing. Yeah. Right? I mean, they don't all do, yeah. I mean, all species are doing things that in some way benefit their survival, and if they can achieve it, they're thriving. But even if we had no answer, how could you get to God from there? Okay, well, I, I would take a step here and move forward to, um, okay, so I've been, I've been studying the near-death experience type stuff, and, you know, it's, it's a lot to get into, but I have, I just have some points here I want to touch on, so... The fact that somebody is floating out of their, their body, they're able to recall situations no, with No, 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 you don't get to say it's a fact that somebody is floating out of their body. What you're talking about is reports. So when I ask you okay. how you can get from these universal human emotions to a god, in, you, you either acknowledge that you have no answer or you want to move on to near-death experiences. And then when we talk about near-death experiences, you start with, with the fact that someone is floating out of their body. That's not a fact. Okay. How do you demonstrate that? Well, you do realize that I, we've we've you, tested you, I, these sorts of things. Okay, go ahead. You do realize that we've yeah, tested I these understand. sorts of things, and we can test them. You know, like you put a note up on a, the top shelf in the in the operating room, and yeah. did anybody see the note? Did they read the note? You're not able to recall, right? Yeah. Right. Okay. Unsurprisingly. All right. But even if they well, did, even if they did, even if we knew that people could leave their bodies as a fact, how the hell does that get you to God? It doesn't. That's just okay. something else that we'll you need an explanation out, for. If you let me just kind of, so just the fact that, okay, there's multiple reports of somebody being floating above their body. 
I mean, that could be, I guess it could be something to do with the brain. You know, we haven't, Very you know, good. Yeah, I, I've had that experience cold. just in, in my own um, experience with um, sleep paralysis. Yeah, a so dying, I've had that experience okay. of floating yeah, above I've my... The same thing. A, a dying or drug-altered yeah. brain, I fail to see why anybody thinks that that's going to give you a more accurate representation of reality. But here's the thing. There are countless okay. reports of... of uh, Indian gurus who survive on what they call prana. They claim that they eat nothing, that they just get energy from the sun. Lots of reports of that. Okay. Does that mean we have good reason to believe it's true? <clears throat> well, I mean, I'm just saying like it point. So the fact that there's floating, you know, somebody can see their body, they're calm. And then there's a light that they encounter. It, it kind of, um, you know, and then you, you kind of go to the Mount of Transfiguration or, or Christ. Oh my gosh. You realize that not all these stories are remotely the same, right? And that these stories are being created by humans yeah, who yeah, already no, have these ideas. Do. You might as well be yeah. saying that the propensity for people to describe an alien abduction as a an almond-headed, almond-eyed creature is evidence that those are the aliens that are actually doing the abduction, instead of saying that these stories started after 2001, A Space Odyssey, and after these sorts, after the, what people's notion of an alien changed to. Aliens used to be monsters and robots, and then they became kind of a norm, and that became the narrative for everybody. Okay. If you've been raised well, with religious ideology and the notion that you have a soul, and you go through this experience okay. of nearly dying, and your brain okay. is starved of oxygen. And then when you recover, you have to figure out what happened when you were seemingly out of it. Is it more likely that a brain invents a story that's consistent with their religious beliefs or that those religious beliefs are true? Well, I mean, it's just, it's something you have to investigate, you know, before you... It's also really easy because people yeah. with the same religious beliefs don't even necessarily have the same experience. Right, but I, they typically, like, I've not heard of anybody, they usually encounter beings, like, a uh, human form. They don't see, like, an animal come to them or, you know, like a... You I know, heard a panel on near-death experiences uh, yeah. where one woman just had the experience of, like, flying over a landscape. She didn't have beings. Right. Well, I'm just, I mean, that could be something that just, you know, is... But the fact that there's a consciousness... And they're able to recall. Well, you think, now wait, you were assuming they recall it, right? This is, this is what they're saying they remember after they right. wake up. Now, we don't know. We don't know that their memory at this point of what actually did or didn't go on while they were unconscious is accurate, correct? But we do know that memory is malleable and flawed. And we invent fictions right. all the time. We lie to ourselves all the time about what we experience and what we remember. It happens all the time. Mm-hmm. No, I mean, yeah, I, I've been studying it a little bit, and there have been some some reports that are kind of like off from what is typically reported. It doesn't matter. It wouldn't matter if everybody reported the exact same thing. If every human being who had nearly died and been resuscitated reported almost word for word the exact same thing, I floated up out of my body, a bunch of yeah. naked pixies surrounded my head and told me that I was bound for a wonderful place and then you drew me back here. Does that mean we have good reason to believe that they were actually bound for a wonderful place? Well, I mean, what else is gonna convince you that, I mean... Evidence, evidence that is good? <laughs> okay. I mean... So you're saying, you're saying if everybody on this planet died and they reported the same exact thing that we were talking about, floating, the naked pixies or whatever. Yes. You, you know why? Someone think that there were... Why is that? Because it's not telling me about what is with respect to pixies in another universe. It's telling me what people say and portray about their experience. Yeah, they don't even have good reason to think that what they experienced was accurate, was like a literal no. accurate um, experience. It is an unfalsifiable proposition. The fact that human beings okay. have similar experiences and relay those experiences in a particular way does not mean that those experiences point to a truth. Yeah, if I dream that I have a dead relative, well, I know, if I dream that I have a dead relative that comes to me and, and talks to me one night, right, in a dream, and right. I wake up the next day, I have no way to differentiate they actually came to me in some way and spoke to me in an unconscious state versus I dreamed that they came and spoke to me while I was asleep. 
there's no way that even I, as the person who had the experience, would know that the difference. And there's certainly no way okay. that I, as someone who didn't okay. have the experience, could do it. So I certainly well, couldn't no. believe based on Tracy's report. Yeah, I wouldn't even be able to believe it. Like, I would have to say, well, I don't this, know. This would be my defense for near death. So if, if it lines up with what, how, so the fact that they come across a light, um, they have a sense of love and peace, which I feel are, it is God's nature. Okay. How do you know that? Um, well, the Bible says that, you know. Why should we care or believe what the God's Bible nature. says? What, why should we care or believe what the Bible says? Well, you, you just said, like, well, you were just asking a question. I'm trying to, like, respond by it, saying. No, no, no. Here's the problem. You completely okay. missed the 2001 analogy. The fact okay. that people have experiences that are consistent with the Bible is irrelevant if they understood what the Bible was saying. If they had exposure to what the Bible says, it's, it's trivial that they would have experiences or report experiences that were consistent with the Bible. Just like if they are aware of how culture has changed with regard to aliens because of 2001, uh, or, or sorry, Close Encounters, the third kind is probably what I should have said. Close Encounters would be the one that, that fundamentally changed this. Um, what you're doing is saying, yeah, but all these people are reporting these same types of aliens. And I'm asking you, okay, but you don't have any reason to think that those alien experiences are accurate just because they're consistent. And then you're saying, yes, but they're also consistent with Close Encounters of the Third Kind. Which all these people saw. Yeah. Okay. I mean, I, I was just... It corrupts your subject just, pool. Well, well, what I'm trying to do is, from the majority of these um, experiences that, that these people experience, I feel line up with, with God. Yeah, and, and the majority of alien experiences stuff. line up with close encounters of the third kind. Well... I know, but God revealed himself through Christ, and that's... Okay. And Close you know, Encounters that, reveals itself through a film that was produced. But, I mean, but, but also, saying what? God reveals himself through Christ is absurd. There is, there is no Christ. There is nobody for you to talk to. There, and, and by the way, in the same way that Tracy's dead grandmother can't reveal herself through Tracy to me, God right. can't reveal himself through another person to you. But you're also making mountains of assumptions when you say God reveals himself through Christ because you're starting with the belief that the Bible is true and accurate and it's a representation of what God thinks and what God wants and this Jesus story and all this other stuff. You are biasing all of your thoughts by beginning with the conclusion that you have a narrative that's believable. And the question is, why should anybody believe that narrative? Okay. Well, um, you know, with my starting... Um, you know, how you're saying the, the footprints, you know, we're thinking God's thoughts after them, you know, love, just peace, order, all these are kind of derivatives of his nature that have been passed to us. And you said so is vengeance and anger species. <laughs> yeah. I mean, those are also, I mean, it's amazing that God is really too. like people. <laughs> Right? Like, I mean, isn't it, yeah. isn't it well, possible I mean, that kind of, people yeah. are just attributing their is. natures to God? Isn't it um, possible that people are making up gods that just happen to be a lot like themselves? And, and, well, and even you before just, you answer, anger. before you answer, right. because you're adopting a Christian model, do you think that all those other religions, people invented gods that were just like them? Or are all those other gods real too? Well, I think there's uh, stronger evidence for Christ because, you know, this... That doesn't evidence. remotely come well, close to ask, answering the question <laughs> about whether or not you think all those other people made up gods that were like them. Okay. That doesn't remotely come well, close to think, answering well, the question well, either. Think, well, you think about Allah is... And this doesn't come remotely. Can you answer the question? Okay. Well, maybe I'm not understanding the question. Do you think that all of the okay. gods that you don't believe in were invented fictions of people creating a god? Are we talking like Zeus, Thor? Holy crap. Uh, all of them. How many do you not believe in? How? What, you, I apologize. Let me back Okay. okay. <laughs> because... I've made this question as simple yes. as possible, but your religious beliefs, oh, oh, your yeah. religious beliefs are preventing you from answering honestly because you're afraid that there's some trap that's going to expose a flaw in your thinking. That's what's going on right okay. now. You believe in Jesus. 
You believe in the biblical yeah. Jesus, right? Yes. You don't believe in other gods. You don't believe in, in the god of uh, Islam or the gods of Hinduism or the gods of uh, any of the other religions ever. You don't believe in any of those, right? Certain mythological, yes, gods, but Allah, Jehovah, that is that is the god that I follow. He's saying those are the same god in his head. Yeah. Okay. Well, I'm saying like they're, they're just interpreting their view of that same God in a different way, but it's... Okay, you know, well, it, that will sidetrack into, okay, that'll sidetrack us into how do you know your way of interpretation is right, but... Right. So let's just go with Zeus. Okay. You think Zeus is an he's invented not, fiction? not real. Okay. Oh, yeah, you'll, you'll go further. You think he's just not real? Correct. Okay. If we know people can invent gods, and we know people have invented gods, or at least you are convinced that people have invented gods, how is it that you exclude yours from being invented? I just, I mean, I think there's a stronger evidence for, for Jesus Christ. I mean, he revealed himself. That's the difference. There we go. That's my answer. Okay. He, he, you realize he that answer says himself. absolutely nothing because you say there's stronger evidence, but you didn't present any evidence. And then you say he revealed himself, which is absurd. Well, he came down. And How do you know that? Her. How do you know that? I mean, okay. You Were you there? Take a step of faith. I, I wasn't there. Why would you take okay. a step of faith? Is there any religion that I couldn't believe if I just took a step of faith? I just feel like there's stronger evidence because he, can, like, there's... Where's the evidence? What is the you evidence? You, okay, so you, you're telling me that you don't believe Jesus ever existed. I'm not convinced that, that I'm not convinced that Jesus existed. I'm also not convinced that he didn't exist. I'm I'm not I'm definitely okay. not convinced that if Jesus existed that he was in fact divine. Okay. Well, I mean, I just feel like he okay, he came down, he died. He was He Jesus came down and he died for humanity. He came down yeah. and he died. Right. How do you know he came down? And where did he come down from? He came down. He came from heaven. How do you know that? He, he's always existed. How do you know that? Go back to Genesis. How do you know that? Believe. Genesis doesn't mention Jesus. And Genesis is irrelevant because you don't get to cite Genesis as if it's evidence for something. Okay. Genesis says a lot of things. I mean, that's my that's what I respond is you know he came down you know he died. I, I understand what you, know. you believe I'm asking why you believe it okay so you're okay the Bible is New Testament talks about that I know you, what you're gonna say is like why should I have any reason to believe that that document is true correct why can't I think some other document like you know, the great Gatsby. No, universe. no, 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 no. I don't care about a document. I don't care about other documents. Okay. I'm asking why I should believe this one is accurate. Okay, well, Christianity is, is spread worldwide. It's one, it, I believe it's the largest religion. Yep, largest or second largest, and, depending on how the numbers work out, but that has no, right. the truth of an idea you isn't impacted by how many okay. people believe it, how long it's been around or anything else. So you can't go with which right. one's older, you'd have to be Jewish. You can't go with which one's larger, you'd probably be Muslim, uh, or potentially, depending on how the numbers work, but it, it just doesn't make any yeah. sense. If you went with oldest, you'd probably be Hindu. Yeah, well. But. Right, well, I'm not gonna go with personal experience because I know how that goes. Okay? Yeah, I'm just, so. I'm literally, I'm serious. I've been doing this so, seemingly for ages, and all I want to know is, okay. why should I believe that the Bible is telling me the truth about what actually happened and what is? Okay, so I would say the revelation of Christ, the fact that Christianity is the strongest consensus of humans on the earth believe in that, so because it's popular, you're saying because it's popular, because a lot of people believe it, I should believe it too. Okay. Is that what you're saying? Well, I'm just saying like if, if, this, if this person came down and, and they were um, not legitimate, just like a 
somebody else who pops up and creates a cult, do you think that that person is going to be able to create a, a following? You mean like Muhammad? Jesus Christ. You mean like Muhammad? I mean, he, he did, you know, but... So, so it's possible you know, then. It's possible to get billions of believers it, centuries afterwards, even if you're a fraud. Buddha. Okay. So, well, I'm just saying, like, the, the, that's that would be how I'd respond. Like, the strongest consensus consensus of people believe in that faith. That, um, and yet, you acknowledge that you, you just acknowledge that that's not a way to tell whether something is true, and yet you come back to it. Okay. The number of people believe well, something. Be able to tell you. The number you know, of people who believe something. He's come meet you at your house today. <laughs> did, has he ever come met you at your house? <laughs> he has not. Hey, do you know of anybody who's ever had him come and meet him at their house? Well, that's okay. And, and I'm not trying to be condescending, but that's what the Jews said to him when he was on the cross. Come down off the cross. And come to my house and prove that you're real. I'm pretty sure if he's sitting there on the cross, I don't have a question about whether he's real. I have a question about no, whether he's divine. That there, there was, you know, they, they were asking the same question that you were that you have right now. Like, I'm, let me let me leave you with this because we're let me leave you with this because we're like 25 okay. minutes over time. If you go through, okay. if you go through and you read the story, Jesus was tempted right by Satan. Okay. In in the Bible that you believe. Yes. I, okay. So Jesus is tempted. What were those temptations? Um, food, um, temptation of um, power. Um, let's see, what else? I, I know that the one was like, cast yourself down yeah, and then the, have sure. angels catch you. Let's, let's go with the yeah. easy one. Okay. Jesus is God, right? Right. And he knows what God knows, because he's God. And, right. he's, and he's existed forever because he's God. Okay. And he knows what's going to happen later, right? Right. Okay. Now, Satan, I'm assuming you think that he was real and the temptation was real. Satan... I, I do believe, yes, he's real. For sure. sure. So Satan has been in God's presence and knows that God is real. Right. And Satan knows that God is all-powerful and is the ruler of everything, correct? Correct. If I walked into your apartment or your house, have you got a big screen TV? Yes, I do. Cool. And I said to you, if you bow down and worship me, I'll give you that big screen TV. What would you say? <laughs> I'd tell you to get out. Wouldn't you say, it's already mine? <laughs> How stupid is it for Satan to tempt Jesus with what is already his. Well, I know, but doesn't it say that... Um, How can it be a temptation? power over to Satan? I How believe he's given power over to him, that God is the, the God of... Satan is the God of this age, is, um, I believe is... What does Jesus care about all the lands that he surveys and ruling them if he's God and rules the fucking universe? There's a problem here. If I walk into your house and offer you your own TV, the, point, the, the correct response is to point out how absurd it is for me to try to tempt you with something that is already yours. Not only is okay. it an absurd thing to do, but both of the entities involved, both Jesus and Satan, would have already realized how absurd this was. The story okay, but is obviously fiction. Okay. That part of the story I, is unequivocally fiction. Sure. Can I, okay, so, so Jesus came down and he was supposed to humble himself and be a perfect sacrifice for people, correct? Wasn't he already perfect? Why would he have to be perfect? Well, I'm saying like he had to maintain the, that perfection until he went and died on the cross. Okay. So a part of that, a part of that would be having to humble himself and, um, you know, be strong and fulfill his mission. How strong, do you you know, how strong do you have to be to turn down someone offering something that's already yours? I don't think that takes strength. Well, if you offer me the money that's in my wallet, it doesn't take strength for me to laugh. 
Right, but I think it was it was um, not only was he was he was humbling himself. I mean, that it, he was setting like an example for human beings. Like, wouldn't wouldn't a better is, example to be right like, what the hell is wrong with you, offering me the stuff I already own? <laughs> I mean, right. yeah, the story is absurd. Think about it some more. But we're like way over time. Oh, we are. <laughs> okay, guys, are, are you still on the air, or did you? We're on no, the air we're, until we're, we're off the air. We're still streaming, so yeah. oh, you're our I final call for the day. And <laughs> thanks so much for the call, and uh, have a good one. I do want to just say one more time that we're having dinner here at the Free Thought Library on Koenig. So feel free to come down if you're interested in that. And also uh, want to mention again the Patreon site where you can go and get ad-free content and sometimes um, unique patron-only only, or patron only content and also maybe get your name in credits if you want to go ahead and donate. And you, like Matt said, you get the warm fuzzy of knowing that you support uh, the work that we're doing here if you find it something you want to support. And, and maybe instead of running 30 minutes over, we'll just stop and then do an <laughs> after want, show that becomes wanna, a patron. I want to issue one thing in my own defense here. That last caller did not stick to the topic that was listed. What was listed? The listed topic was that he was uh, disagreed with the burden of proof, felt like it, that he should not have the burden of proof. That, and now, I again, I'm going, this is, a, this is translated from I think that's what he thought. It's he, just we didn't talk about it. He felt like it was a cop-out because, you know, and I'm thinking to myself when I got that, I, I really wanted to ask um, something along the lines of how is the fact that you don't have evidence the other person's problem, yeah, right? Like explaining that you can't demonstrate it, that you don't have the evidence. Um, how does that then make make me wrong for pointing that out? So, but it didn't happen. So it's just a fantasy in my mind. And thank you to the audience and to the crew and to my special <laughs> co-host, Mr. Dill Honey, and thank you to our callers and everyone.